New immigration, 1880 to 1924. Um, from the very beginning, people have always looked at the United States as a nation of immigrants, and that's something we love to say about ourselves. And it is true that most Americans, um, if you go back far enough, we come from somewhere else. Um, you know, even, you know, of course, even Native Americans, if you go back far enough, come from Asia originally. But most Americans today are not Indians, they're not Native Americans. So. Uh, initially, we were mostly for Western Europe, or we were mostly from Western Africa. Um, but we always had some immigrants. We had some Irish coming in after 1848. We see some Germans coming in in the 1850s. But as we discussed on the first day of class, in 1865, when US II begins, um, we were mostly West, Western Europeans, mostly British, French, German, maybe a little Scandinavian, or again, we were Western African, and that's pretty much it. Very little diversity other than that. That completely changes after 1880, which is, again, hence the term new immigration. By 1880, we see a huge influx of new peoples coming in. Peoples that today we wouldn't even think of as immigrants, but at the time would have been very different cultures. And it ends in 1924, and as we'll see at the end of this lecture, that's a hard deadline. Uh, something happens that year that really ends immigration, if you will. Before we get started, as you guys know, I like to use images, especially cartoons and political cartoons. because they, I think they really convey ideas very quickly um, of, you know, they really get into the time period. And here's a, a cartoon from the 1890s. And here you have uh, what I would consider a very ambivalent cartoon. Ambivalent means it could go either way. It could be this, but it could also be that. Um, here you have the United States portrayed as a schoolhouse, if you will. You can see the schoolhouse in the background and the, the American flag. And you can see what looks like, you know, happy but fairly rowdy children. I mean, it just looks like a typical, uh, you know, preschool place. And you can see, if you look hard enough, you can see, you know, stereotypes of all different types of people. You see African Americans, and somebody's supposed to be German American, and what it looks like to be English American and Chinese Americans. Um, and then you see the teacher, and that's a grown-up. Uh, again, that's, I think, an important distinction there. And she's white. And then you see uh, another child coming in who looks, quote-unquote, primitive. Uh, this is actually supposed to be somebody from the South Pacific Islands. And then you see another little girl who is, because you see some American flags, that's obviously an American as well. And they're, you know, they're bringing this new child into the school of the U.S., and it's ambivalent because overall it's meant to be a positive image. I mean, the kid looks very shy, but it doesn't look like a, a school that doesn't want this child. So the teacher is basically saying, you know, come on in. And that was America. We didn't have any immigration laws uh, at this point. In 1880, no immigration laws. Anybody could come to this country. Now, they may not be citizens yet. Native Americans weren't citizens yet. Um, a lot of Asian immigrants couldn't become citizens yet, but they could come here. There was no border patrol, if you will. But at the same time, you know, so again, it's overly a positive image. It's not an anti-immigration image. But often we have biases without even realizing it. And I think the cartoonist here, and many Americans at this time, had their own biases. Because again, notice who's the only grown-up, the American. The only one who knows how to behave. And even the American child is the only one behaving well. Um, everybody else who are like many adults, are acting like crazy people. And again, the message seems to be people come to this country to become civilized, to learn how to behave. And I think it betrays a bit of an attitude towards foreign people. That yes, they're welcome, but they need to learn how to behave well. And we're gonna, we're gonna teach them how to behave well. So even though it's not necessarily the purpose of the cartoon, there is a judgment being made. And I think that very much describes this time period. Like some of the other lectures uh, during this period of the late 1800s and early 20th century, we see this sort of yin and yang, this ambivalence where positive things are happening. But on the other hand, we see stuff that today we will look at on as very negative. And I think new immigration is, is a good example of that. And, 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 it, and one more thing, I know I'm spending a long time on this one slide, but even today, 2015, we still, I think, have this ambivalence about immigration. 
Because again, we're all immigrants. And generally speaking, we like immigrants once they've been here a while. But many Americans are very suspicious of recent immigrants. Today, it might be people who are from the Middle East, people who are Muslim, maybe even Latin Americans for some Americans. 30 years ago, it was Cubans and Puerto Ricans. Um, back in the 40s, it was Japanese Americans. In the early 20th century, it was Italian Americans and Polish Americans and Jewish Americans. In the 1880s, it was actually Chinese Americans. Before that, it was African Americans. In other words, there's always been some group that we think are dangerous. And then, they, then they're here for a while and we get used to them and they become one of us. And it's, it's an unfortunate process, but it's part of our history. So we're starting another, with another cartoon. Here is from 1869, just after Reconstruction, a cartoon from a magazine called Harper's Weekly called Uncle Sam's Thanksgiving Dinner. On one side it says, come one, come all. On the other side it says, free and equal. In the middle is a big cake that says, universal suffrage, meaning voting for everybody. That the Civil War was just the beginning. Eventually everyone could come here and everyone can be free. And that's how I think today we think of ourselves. We're a nation of freedom. We're a nation of immigrants and everyone's welcome. Uh, that was a radical idea in 1869. And it was also an idea that was easy to have for people at that time before they actually had a lot of immigrants. But notice it's a big round table. Everyone's equal. There's nobody who's really at the head of the table. Everyone is seen in a very respectful, decent way. I'm going to show you a different cartoon, also called Uncle Sam, Sam's Thanksgiving Dinner, a little bit later. And it's going to portray a very different image. Now, when you were going to school, I bet you guys all did the same thing. At some point, after the bell rang, uh, maybe it was the very beginning of class, maybe at the end of your first class, you probably all did something the same. You probably all stood up, placed your hand over your heart, faced the American flag, and did the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, and you may have wondered, like I used to, where does that come from? I always thought I went back to Jefferson and Washington, but it's actually something they would not have liked, the idea of pledging allegiance to a flag. That's something that a, almost a king would make you do. So the founding fathers would have hated that. In fact, the founding fathers even debated about having a flag at all at one point. Uh, it actually comes from the 1890s. It, it's from this time period. And, of course, it's very American. Because it actually started out basically as an advertisement. Um, a magazine called Youth Companion uh, wanted to sell more flags. So they came up with the idea of sort of a, a, a flag day in 1892 as part of the celebration uh, for Christopher Columbus's discovery of the New World. So they said, wouldn't it be neat if everybody in America at the same time faced the flag and, and just said something together? And, uh, and we'll be more than willing to sell those flags. So they hired a guy named Francis Bellamy, who was a progressive, who was a Christian socialist, who was somebody who believed in helping the poor out and all that. And he said, you know, to Bellamy, could you write something? And so he did. He wrote this nice little, if you will, little saying. And uh, this, is, this is the Bellamy uh, pledge. I'm going to read it out to you. I pledge allegiance to my flag and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. When I was a kid, I always thought it said one nation, invisible. But one nation, indivisible, which refers to the Civil War. You can't divide it. The Civil War proved you can't divide this nation. And you may also notice there's something else missing. There's a phrase, under God, that is not in there. That phrase wasn't actually added until 1954 because of the Cold War. During the Cold War, the Russians didn't allow uh, their citizens to go to church. To be a good communist meant you had to be an atheist. In America, of course, we have freedom of religion. So, you know, this was a, adding the term under God was seen as a way to celebrate the fact that we're allowed to be religious. Of course, in 1892, that would have been seen in an opposite way. It would have been seen as preferential to one religion over another, because not everybody necessarily believes in God. And it is interesting that today we've kind of, we still argue that. Um, but anyway, the ad worked and it became, you know, kind of traditional. Oh, I forgot. There's one more thing. Bellamy came up with the way to do it. We all put our, place our hand over our heart when we do it. 
Bellamy did it. He said, this is how you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to say, I pledge allegiance to my flag and to, and when you say all that, when you say to my flag, you're supposed to then move your hand from your heart into a straight line and point it at the flag. This is called the Bellamy salute. And you can find a lot of old images of kids doing the Bellamy salute. Of course, we all know it as the Heil Hitler salute, the Nazi salute. And it is where Adolf Hitler got that from. He stole it from Bellamy. And uh, so anyway, you don't see a lot of these images anymore because obviously it looks like a bunch of Nazi kids. But that is actually how you're supposed to have done it. Um, it wasn't until the 1920s that Congress actually adopted this. Because it gets kind of started becoming a tradition. Uh, it's like singing Happy Birthday. Happy Birthday used to be a commercial song. But over time, people, everybody started singing it. And now it's just tradition. You sing Happy Birthday to everybody on their birthday. Same thing here. And it really wasn't until World War II that everybody really started doing it in a big way because it was a big war. And now it's you know part of what we do. Um, and I've always thought it was kind of a sweet gesture, as long as you don't make people do it, as long as but if they want to do it, I think it's great. Um, and of course, a lot of people who become citizens are very proud to do this for the first time. You know, it's, you know, it is their flag. So why did this start in the 1890s? Why am I talking about it now, other than it's just a weird trivia thing? Um, Again, it's always interesting why things stick. Why do things develop and then they hang around, don't go away. But this is a good example of one of those because, you know, it could have just happened one time, it went away, but somehow this stuck. And one of the reasons I think it did was because 1890s was a time of when millions of immigrants were coming over to this country. And there was a real fear that these immigrants would start to think you know, maybe wouldn't be loyal to America, wouldn't be loyal to the flag. So there was a sense that this was for the immigrants to remind them that that is now their flag. And as they say this, they can remind themselves what America stands for. Again, it's not necessarily an ugly thing, but, but it, is, it is coming out of this, what we call xenophobia, which means fear of foreigners. I mean, there is a, there is a xenophobic element to this. And so again, it's one of the reasons why I think the pledge stuck and why we still do it today, over 100 years later. It is true, though. There were lots and lots of people during this period. Again, we date the new immigration from about 1880 to 1924. And this is just a couple of statistics. 1890 to 1912, for instance, 23 million immigrants entered the U.S. In fact, 10 million came over between 1900 and 1910. 10 million people. And that's just, a, that's not even the entire period. In 1920, a third of the nation had parents, that at least one of their parents were not born in this country. A third of the country, at least one of their parents weren't born in this country. That is a phenomenal statistic. And, uh, and of course, you know, these people, you know, they're us, they're you and I now. They're, you know. But at that time, there was a fear of this, is this too many, too fast? Are there too many people here? They come over too quickly. Are they going to change the country? Are they going to ruin the country? Obviously, today we can say no. The answer was no. We're, we're still here. We're, we're just as good as we ever have been. And, and I've always argued that immigrants are America's secret weapon. You know, they, every few years, new people come over with new ideas and new foods and new, and new ways of doing things. And it's like we get refreshed. We don't get stale. We don't get old. Um, but at the time, and it's understandable, you know, looking back, why people might feel this way. Right now in Europe, there's millions of people moving into Europe, and there's a lot of fear that Europe may stop being European. Um, if we're anything to go by, the answer would be no. But again, that's a real fear today, in the same way there was a real fear at this time. So if we're talking about old immigrants, that obviously implies that, I mean, excuse me, new immigrants, that obviously implies there must have been some old immigrants. So who do we mean when we say old immigrants? I have 1880 uh, 1800, 1880 here, but really it could just be any time before 1880. Old immigrants are those who came over before 1880. Um, you know, the, the founding fathers, if you will, the colonists, and then the few immigrants that came over uh, before 1880, before the Civil War. Most immigrants were from Northwest Europe, you know, places like England, Germany, France. Um, again, around the 1840s, we start seeing a little bit more from Ireland. We do, and we'll talk about this later, we do see a few coming over from China, but overwhelmingly, this is Northwestern Europe. 
These are people that really look like everybody else who was already here, not counting African American, obviously. And again, I, I don't have them on here because they were forced immigrants. In other words, before the Civil War, primarily they were slaves. There really wasn't a choice there. And they were sort of segregated out from mainstream society. But those immigrants who actually chose to come over basically looked like everybody else, racially speaking. And even culturally, um, they weren't that different. I mean, English is a Germanic language, so even Germans coming over would adapt fairly easily. Similar holidays, similar foods, similar way of dressing. If you've ever moved anywhere else, you know how awkward it can be, especially around holiday time or when you're shopping for food. And, you know, that's when you really start to feel those differences. You know, these people would have fit in fairly quickly. Uh, religiously, most of these people would have not just been Christian, but would have been Protestant Christian, which is what most Americans were at this point. And generally, these weren't the poorest of the poor. They, they were often skilled, they could read, they, they, had, they had job skills, or at least semi-skilled. In other words, they could adapt fairly quickly. And, and within a few years, many people wouldn't even have known that they were immigrants. So these are old immigrants. And there never were a huge number anyway. I mean, these were relatively small numbers. But with new immigrants, again, 1880 to 1924, number one, before I even go any further, lots and lots of them, millions of them. And most of these people are going to be coming from Southern Europe, like Spain and Italy, Greece, and Eastern Europe, like Russia and Poland and Czechoslovakia, places of that nature. And I don't have it on here, but we do see some people coming over from China and Japan as well. Um, I have darker skin. That's not necessarily true, but there was a perception that these people were darker. Um, some actually might have been. They may have looked a little bit different, um, but there was a perception that they were. Um, but they dressed differently. Their food was very different. Um, and we'll talk more about food in just a moment. Um, again, very different languages. And a lot of these people would have been Catholic or Jewish. Again, today, who cares? But at that point, they would have been seen very differently. And that celebrate very different holidays, have very different rituals and traditions and customs. Um, and some of these people, especially from places like Russia and Italy, were extremely poor, often completely, absolutely no education, um, illiterate, and again, would have had a harder time fitting in initially. And if you were to gone to New York in 1900, you could have been able to tell who were the immigrants and who weren't. I mean, just by looking at people, it would have been very, very obvious. Uh, they would have stood out more. Before we go any further, we need a couple of definitions. Uh, push and pulls, these are two words that we often use with immigration. Push is why somebody leaves their homeland. Very few people really want to leave. You know, it's where you're from, it's where you grew up, it's where your family is, your heritage. Uh, but there is usually a reason that pushes you out. Sometimes it's the government. Um, you know, like during the Cold War, we see a lot of people being pushed out by communists. Sometimes it's, it is for religious reasons. And I think Americans always think that. Everybody comes over here for religious freedom. The reality is very few people come here initially for religious freedom or for democracy or anything like that. Um, but there are a few groups, in particular uh, Jewish immigrants, um, especially in places like Russia and other places. They, they often were outlaws. They had to come here. But generally, most of the immigrants came to the United States. And by the way, they were also going to places like England, too. It was in Canada and Australia. It wasn't just the U.S. they were coming to. Um, but when they came to the U.S., they were coming here mostly for economic reasons, primarily jobs. They, couldn't, they, they needed to feed their families. They needed to go somewhere they could have jobs. And as we've already talked about, America was exploding with technology and jobs. Uh, and again, I just described the pull. So there's a reason why you leave. But then where do you go? Some, some, some place has got to pull you in. And places like Australia, Canada, England, and of course the U.S. were pulling these guys in because there are lots of jobs here, lots of room to live. In fact, a lot of factories were advertising in countries, hey, come work for us. We want you here. So push and pulls. And not to get overly political, but a lot of times to nowadays people argue about immigration. And it is a big topic. And you know, a lot of people want to stop immigration. And I always argue, if you really want to stop immigration, don't build a wall. But instead, look at what's pushing people away from their country. Why are they having to leave? Try to solve that problem. And you solve the problem of immigration. So these are just some of the groups that we call new immigrants, Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, Russians, Italians, Jewish, you know. Uh, and these are some of the groups I'm going to be referencing today. 
and in later lectures as well. There's actually lots and lots of groups. And there is one that doesn't seem to fit the others. You know, J Japanese from Japan, Russians are from Russia, Italians from Italy, Chinese from China, Jewish, well, there's no Jew land, there's no Judea, there's no, you know, that doesn't seem to fit. That's a religion, that's a culture, not a country. The reason historians kind of, kind of call them Jewish Americans instead of saying, oh, Russian Americans who happen to be Jewish or Italians who happen to be Jewish is because at that time, 1890s, early 20th century, they were always distinguished as a unique group, regardless of where they're from. If you were Jewish, that kind of came first. So that's, that's a product of the time period. And we're going to talk a little bit about Jewish immigrants a little bit later. Again, if you've ever moved you know, from somewhere else. I know some in this particular class came from, say, New Jersey or Michigan down to the south, and you pretty much notice immediately the food differences, the accent differences. Food is, it's not just something we need to survive, but it is a very much a part of who we are. It's part of our religion, our family heritage. It's part of our culture. It, it's, you know, again, once you're denied the food you're used to, you tend to be a very unhappy camper. Um, and it's interesting if you think about American foods today. Um, I can ask people to name you know, typical American foods. They may say pizza and hamburgers and hot dogs. And of course, those are all foreign foods. Those were considered immigrant foods. Uh, those were not foods that were American at all. I mean, I think a lot of people today would be quite surprised if they went back in time. Uh, again, take pizza, for example. Um, we don't see pizza in this country, as far as we can tell, until about 1905, uh, when Lombardi's, this is Lombardi's right here in New York City, opens up the first documented pizzeria in America. Not too long after that, we start to see some pizzerias also open up in Chicago. Um, and in fact, a couple of years ago, I took some students to work uh, here in New York with some students and some Lombardi's. And there's some of Bainbridge College students. Uh, trying some of Lombardi's pizza. In fact, there's a close-up of it. A uh, very typical New York-style pizza there. It was pretty good. I've actually had better New York than this one. Um, but let's just take pizza for a moment. Um, again, it's weird to think that there was a time when there was no pizza in America. In fact, before this period of the immigration, food in America was actually kind of boring. Um, you know, chicken would have been common, beef, steak, a lot of boiled vegetables, very little seasoning, salt and pepper, that's about it. Think, think about what you cook with today. Olive oil, paprika, and parmesan, and garlic, and all of this. None of that would have been available uh, before new immigration. In fact, there's a term, a very derogatory term for immigrants. It used to be called garlic eaters. If you wanted to insult somebody, you say, you, I bet you're a garlic eater. That means I bet you're an immigrant. Because garlic was seen as one of these gross things that only immigrants now, I can't, I can't imagine going through life without garlic. Um, so, again, to give you an example of this, let, let's say, for instance, pizza. Mm -hmm. You know, I was born in the early 70s. Uh, my parents, who grew up in Arkansas and in Florida, they never had pizza until the first time I had pizza, which was about 1974 when I was two years old. That was the first time they'd ever had pizza. Um, and, in fact, most Americans outside of New York or Chicago. Most Americans didn't have pizzas until the 1950s. And a lot of places, especially down here in the South, again, it wasn't until the 70s and 80s before many people had pizza or spaghetti for the first time. I did some research uh, not too long ago on Bainbridge. And, you know, I, I look at yearbooks, uh, excuse me, phone books and directories, trying to figure out what food was available in Bainbridge. So I went back to 1956. 1956 in Bainbridge, there was no Chinese, Mexican, Pizza or fast food places anywhere in Bainbridge or the surrounding areas. Uh, 1959, the restaurants that were in Bainbridge were things like Edna's Cafe, Kirkland's Cafe, GD Drive-In, Lewin Place, Do Drop-In, and the Chicken Shack. Uh, the first fast food place, a hamburger place, which is also a new immigrant food, comes from Germany. 1965, Chandler's, which is on Shotwell Street. 1969, you get your first ma major fast food place, and that was KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. 1971, you get your first Dairy Queen, and you get your first Dairy Co., which later becomes known as Carter's Hamburgers. And only in the 1980s does it become known as Carter's Fried Chicken. Um, 
1975, you got your first Hardee's and McDonald's. 1977, the same year that Star Wars comes out, you got your first pizza place. You got Pizza Hut. It had two types of pizza, thin and crispy or thick and crispy. 1986 was the first Chinese restaurant in town, Hong Kong, China. 1990, the year I graduated high school, was the very first Mexican restaurant. And of course, it was Taco Bell. There's also a pizza you bake, a Domino's pizza, and a Golden Star Chinese restaurant. And then 1996 is the first true sit-down Mexican restaurant, and that was Old Mexico. So again, right here in Bainbridge, there wasn't a lot of variety until fairly recently. And even today, uh, I think Yuki's, which uh, serves Japanese food, uh, that's only that's less than 10 years old. Um, and there, of course, there's no Indian places. Uh, very few Italian places, but still relatively old-fashioned here. Uh, but again, notice all the variety is in the last 30 years, last 20 years or so. And again, that's quite typical for American diet. As one student said one year, uh, boy, American food was pretty boring before new immigration, and I would agree with that. For most Americans, their first Italian food would have been Chef Boyardee. Um, I, don't, I can't do it right now, but when I get done recording the lecture, I'm going to put another short video up of an advertisement for Chef Boyardee. And you can get us, you know, that was a real guy. He was a guy in Cleveland, Ohio. He didn't spell his name this way, um, but this is, he spelled it B-O-Y-A-R-D-E-E -E, so that everybody would know how to pronounce it. Uh, so, as actually he pronounced it, Chef Boyardee, uh, he started making spaghetti. And again, that was an exotic food. Most Americans had never had spaghetti. And in the 1920s, somebody said, look, you should sell this outside, you know, like, like package this. And he went, great idea. And so Chef Boyardee started packaging spaghetti dinners. And the advertiser I'm going to put on the online, on uh, he has to explain to people, this is 1950s, he has to explain to people what spaghetti actually is and how you make it. Sauce and you get the, you know, the, the pasta and you mix it all together. And then Chef Boyardee started making pizzas. You know, in other words, you know, you, you buy this little box and it tells you how to do it. Um, this is again 1950s. For most Americans, Chef Boyardee would have been their very first pizza. You know, this crazy Italian thing of pizza. Uh, and even I can still remember as a kid in the 70s, it was a big deal to eat a pizza. It was like, ooh, that was a special night. And uh, same with tacos. Tacos was something like nobody ate tacos in the 70s. Uh, and think about, again, just think right here in Bainbridge or, or just southwest Georgia. You go to Thomasville and go to Starbucks right here in Bainbridge. You can go to, uh, you know, The Bean. Go to Tallahassee. You go to coffee places. You can have your espresso, cafe, Americano, your latte, your cappuccinos. Um, you can go to McDonald's and get your bagel, you know, and your mocha. You probably don't even think about it. But these are Italian coffees. And bagels are Jewish foods. And these are foods that even just 20 years ago, you couldn't have, you couldn't have ate, eaten or drunk here in Bainbridge. You just, people wouldn't know what you're talking about. They would you say, you got to go to New York for that stuff. You got to go to another country. And, you know, we forget that, you know, how much of what we do every single day that we consider to be very American started out as something that was seen as foreign, as something exotic, different. So again, here's some classic American foods. Hot dogs originally comes from Eastern Europe. Hamburgers from Hamburg, Germany. Both of those made their premieres in the 1890s here in America. Bagels, again, talking about the Middle East, the Jewish food. And now everybody eats bagels. Fortune cookies. What's interesting is that sometimes it goes the other direction. When you go to your local Chinese restaurant, most of the food you're eating is actually not very Chinese at all. It's very Americanized. In China, they don't eat that much meat. So the fact that it's all meat is a sign that it's been Americanized. And, um, and of course, a lot of those dishes were actually, you know, were actually created in the U.S., like things like chop suey and such. The fortune cookies are, are really interesting. There's entire histories of fortune cookies. Um, it's not Chinese at all. Number one, fortune cookies were invented in California. They were invented in Los Angeles, but they were invented in a Japanese restaurant. And the hint is the fact that it's a cookie. 
Chinese culture, generally speaking, isn't big on sweets, especially this kind of sweet, in the same way Japanese culture is. If you want candy, go to Japan, not China. Um, and in Japan, they're very known for their little cakes and such, and especially little prizes inside. Uh, this actually started out in a Japanese restaurant in Los Angeles, and then in San Francisco, a Chinese restaurant picked it up and started imitating it. And it seemed to fit the American image of the mysterious Chinese. But there is no tradition of doing this at all in China. These, this is a wholly American thing to do. And most of the fortune cookies you eat today are actually made up in New York. And most of the fortunes are written by college students in the Bronx. I think back in the day, people, when you thought of immigrants, you thought of Italians more than any other group. Today, you tend to think of people from Mexico and other parts of Latin America. And probably the most common, other than pizza, the most common uh, immigrant food that people eat today in this country are uh, Mexican food, things like burritos and tacos. And the history of Mexican food is interesting because, again, it, it's, a, it's a real mix of genuine Mexican food, but also things that are a mix of American taste and such. Um, for instance, people think of tequila as being Mexican, and of course it comes from the agave plant, but tequila is actually initially made by the Spanish, uh, and agave actually comes from the Philippines, it's actually Asian, and uh, the, the Spanish are the ones who actually introduced tequila to Mexico, and margaritas, which, which is Spanish for daisy, was invented in the 1930s for American tourists to drink. It actually wasn't something that uh, uh, Mexicans would have drank it themselves. The idea of taking tortillas and wrapping them up with meat and cheese and vegetables, now that goes back thousands of years in Latin America. That itself is uh, something that's very uh, common there. Uh, but the idea of, again, the taco um, really has its origins in California. Um, burrito comes from northern Mexico, I, and I don't do Spanish very well, but burros, which means small, means like a small meal. And it was kind of a poor person's meal. You just take a tortilla, wrap anything you have in it, and wrap it up like a sandwich and eat it. Um, again, if anybody's ever been to Mexico, if you go all over Mexico, you realize that so much Mexico don't even eat burritos or tacos. That's very much a northern Mexico, southern U.S. thing to eat. Um, sometimes it's called Tex-Mex, which is a term that was invented in the 1960s. It's actually kind of a recent term. But it's an accurate term, kind of acknowledging the mix of American and Mexican influences. So much of Mexican food doesn't look anything like what you would think of as Mexican food. Uh, it's wonderful if you ever get a chance to go down there, but it is very different from a lot of the food that you would eat today. Uh, fajitas, of course, are one of the big things everybody always talks about. You go to the restaurants, you get this big, see this big sizzling plate of meat. Uh, you know, they say, don't touch the plate, it's hot. You know, that actually was invented in the 1970s, again, in California. And it was actually kind of invented as just sort of a... Uh, uh, in fact, 1973, I just looked at my notes, the exact year of that. Uh, and it was done to make it seem more exotic, you know. It was, it was just meat, you know, just meat grilled and some vegetables. But, but by making it hot and sizzling, you know, it makes it an event. Everyone's like, oh, I want one of those. So it made it seem more foreign and more exciting and all that. Ah, let's skip this today. Um, I know some of you may not be old enough to drink beer, but if you ever go to a Mexican restaurant and you get something like Dos Equis or Corona, they always make a point of putting that darn lime in it. And I remember I had friends growing up, they say, yeah, Mexican beer is terrible. Yeah, you got to do this to make it taste good, which is garbage, by the way. If you like beer, Mexican beer is actually quite good. Um, but everybody says, this is just how you do it. You're supposed to put a lime in it. This was invented in Philadelphia in 1985 as a way to get people to buy beer. Um, they, they literally, and it wasn't, these were, you know, Americans that invented this. They invented this tradition of putting a lime in it to make it, you know, make it taste better. And this is how Mexicans do it. And I said, today you go to Mexico and they'll sometimes serve it to you this way. But this is a completely American invention. So again, what I'm kind of doing here is showing a lot of our images of other cultures is sometimes completely invented. It's fictional. And again, I, you know, the fears that sometimes people have of immigrants aren't, aren't even based on reality or, you know, so sometimes uh, before you start talking about immigrants and food, scratch, scratch at the surface a little bit and you'll realize a lot of what you think is reality isn't necessarily reality at all. Um, Cinco de Mayo, 5th of May. Um, 
you know, that's a big thing here in this country to go to a Mexican restaurant and have some beer and drink some tequilas and some margaritas and say ole very loud. I was actually in Mexico, Cinco de Mayo, way back in 1999. And I was very disappointed that nothing happened. Uh, Cinco de Mayo is indeed an actual holiday in Mexico, but it's kind of like Memorial Day or Columbus Day. It's not that big a deal. Um, Cinco de Mayo started to become a big deal in this country, again, for tourists in Southern California, when Americans would sometimes venture into Mexican-American neighborhoods. So sometimes they would play this up a little bit. By the way, 5th of May was a battle uh, in 18... Ooh, I'm going to get the year wrong. I want to say 1863, but I may be off on the year. But during our Civil War, there was a big battle, the Battle of Pueblo, which is when the French were fighting the Mexicans, and the Mexicans won. So it was a big deal. It kept the French from taking over Mexico. Uh, but that's all it was. It's not their 4th of July. In fact... Uh, the Mexican Independence Day is in September, which is when a lot of Latin American Independence Days is. That is a big celebration. But this is really a day that's kind of, it's like St. Patrick's Day. In Ireland, it's not that big a deal. But over here, we make a big deal about St. Patrick's Day. Um, and again, just like Pledge of Allegiance, notice how much of this goes back to it's a way to make money. It's a thing for tourists. Uh, that's kind of an ongoing, I think, theme in a lot of stuff here. Oh, here's another you know, it's turned into this holy, silly thing now. And and actually, if I was Mexican-American, I would be probably pretty insulted at a lot of this. But it really doesn't, in any real way, recognize actual Mexican culture. It is, a, a, again, a, a, a Hollywood version of Mexican culture. Oh, I've already talked about this. This is where tequila comes from. This is the agave plant. Finally, Taco Bell, which we have a nice one right here in Bainbridge. And I utilize it quite often. Taco Bell actually began in California again. And by the way, notice so much of this is California because that's where a lot of Asian immigrants first arrived. And obviously, it's where a lot of Mexican immigrants first arrived. Taco Bell actually started out as Bell's Hamburgers. But in 1953, there was a lot of hamburger competition. So the company changed the name to Taco Bell and started serving uh, Mexican food. And there's a great series of videos on YouTube of actual Mexicans trying Taco Bell for the first time. And... Uh, it, it is funny, their responses, because they're all kind of like, it's okay, it's not Mexican, though. But I think, again, for most Americans, myself included, often their first taco, especially in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, would have been Taco Bell. And this is an early menu. You can see how simple the menu used to be back in the 70s and 80s. Um, not a, really a whole lot going on here. Um, anyway. All right, let's get off food. I could keep talking about it, but I realize I'm taking a long time. So these for these new immigrants, how would this have worked? Well, again, initially, immigrants could come over anywhere they wanted, anytime they wanted. But in 1892, the federal government decided that maybe it would be time to start funneling people uh, to certain parts of the country. Um, you know, because there was some genuine fears of crime and disease and things like that. So in 1892... The federal government set up Ellis Island, um, which was, a, again, an island designed to uh, process all these new immigrants. So we have an idea how many and who they are and where they're coming from. So the way it worked is if you were coming from Europe, and by the way, we would not see many immigrants from Latin America at this point. That comes later. And we would not have seen hardly any from Africa at this point. This has been mostly Europe. So let's say you're coming from Italy. You would arrive on a ship and you would have gone to the harbor right there at New York, you would have gone from the big ship and then you would have uh, landed on a small ferry. And that ferry would have taken you past the Statue of Liberty, which is on an island called Bledsoe Island. Today it's known as Liberty Island. And that would have been a big deal for people to see that statue, uh, a symbol of America, American liberty, American freedom. It would have been a very emotional moment for a lot of them. Here is an image of Ellis Island. Obviously, this is taken from the Statue of Liberty. Uh, obviously, a pre-9-11 image, because you can see the Twin Towers in the background. Here's another image of Ellis Island. Today, it's not functioning anymore. It's actually a national park today. You can do tours of it, in fact. Um, but you would have gone to Ellis Island, and they would have you know, done some medical checks on you, make sure you didn't have any diseases. They would have, as good as they could back then, they would have done some kind of criminal check. They would have checked your name and all that. And 
um, made sure that you were who you said you were and you were ready to go. There's some people waiting to get processed. One thing you see in a lot of movies is where it shows Ellis Island people changing people's names. That rarely ever actually happened. Their, their names weren't suddenly changed. In fact, Ellis Island staff would have, spoken, would have spoken very good Italian or Spanish or Greek. So there would have been no language problems there. But they would have checked for your health. Uh, by and large, most of these people would have been quite healthy. I mean, that's a real concern. Um, I always make the same joke, but it's I'll, I'll make a joke later. Um, but it turns out less than 5% of the people were turned away for health reasons. And that makes sense if you stop and think about it. If you're living in Italy and your family's very poor and somebody's got to go to America to make money, you're not sending sick old grandma with tuberculosis to America. You're going to send the young, healthy kid to America to make money. So it's almost self-selecting. So most of these people actually were in fairly good health. But if you weren't, sometimes you were quarantined for a while if you showed signs of smallpox or chickenpox or something like that. And again, a few people were rejected and sent back. And again, if you ever seen Godfather Part Two, one of the greatest movies ever made, they have a really good reconstruction, a recreation of this. But as you get any kind of this cattle pen you're going through as you're waiting to get processed, uh, this is again another image of Ellis Island. A few years later, they also developed uh, an area called Angel Island, which is just off the coast of California, in fact, just off the coast of San Francisco, and this was to process the people coming over from Asia, places like the Philippines. Japan, China. Um, again, the numbers were never very high for Asia, uh, but it was enough that they needed its own processing plant. Um, again, I think these images show that it's a little less welcoming. There was no Statue of Liberty for the Asians. And, and that's fairly typical. Americans were much more fearful of Asians back then than they were of Europeans. And, um, and in fact, you'll see in a few moments uh, some real evidence of that. Um, it was, it was a little more of a prison than, than not. Today, Angel Island is still there today. It's a, it's a California state park. You can actually go and visit it today. It, again, it's no longer a functioning processing plant. So if you came to America, you either went through Ellis Island and then went wherever you were going, or you went to Angel Island in California. Now, after a while, there was some real concern. Um, you know, in the early 20th century, we do see rising po uh, poverty, we see rising pollution, rising crime. Um, and a lot of people were wondering what had changed. Of course, today, looking back, it's just like, oh, well, we were just becoming a bigger country. We were becoming more urbanized. And those are the problems of a big country, crime and pollution and population and all that. Um, but at the time, people thought, well, there must be another reason for this. Uh, it must be the immigrants. And again, I hate to get too political, but that should sound a little bit familiar to you today. Uh, you do hear this every so often. Um, but anyway, the Congress did what it was supposed to do, and that is it investigated. In 1911, Congress did a huge investigation of immigration in America, and they, they produced a 40-volume um, study um, about the immigration problem, quote-unquote problem. And this is one of the volumes here. And as you can see, it says, Immigration and Insanity, which gives you a sense of where they were coming from. Now, earlier we, in this class, not in this lecture, but earlier in this class, we talked about eugenics, the idea of studying genes to try to figure out who has better genes than others. And the most famous of these eugenicists was a guy named Charles Davenport. He's the guy here on the right. Um, I mean, he was the top scientist. He was, the, you know, if I was to ask you to name the scientist today, uh, most of you probably talk about Neil Tyson DeGrasse or something, you know, or Bill Nye. He was that guy back in 1911, and he was a eugenicist. And he was asked to testify uh, to Congress. And so I'm going to read a little bit of his uh of his testimony very quickly. He said to Congress, the population of the United States will, on account of the great influx of blood from southeastern Europe, will rapidly become darker in pigmentation, smaller in stature, more given to crimes of kidnapping, assault, murder, rape, sex immorality, by the way, that's code word for, for homosexuality, and the ratio of insanity in a population 
will rapidly increase. Whoa. That's pretty damning uh, testimony there. So if you're living in 1911 and you're in Bainbridge, Georgia, and you hear the top scientists of America telling you that if more people from Italy and Poland and Russia come over, we're all going to be dark-skinned, we're all going to be insane, and we're all going to be gay, we're all going to be killing each other. Oh my God, what, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Now, I'm not being sarcastic. That's, I mean, that was, I mean, that's what he is saying. Um, and again, it was very compelling uh, testimony. And what did he base this on? Now, some of it, you can even tell, some of this is just fear. But he, what Davenport did is, again, as a eugenicist, he, would, he and his people would go to Ellis Island. And they did this for, for, for years. And they would take photos of everybody that came, came ashore. And, you know, take a photo of their face, their profile, take all their measurements, and then take their life story, how poor they were, could they read or not, you know, how educated were they. And he would start to make these conclusions. And he, he argued, he said, for instance, you know, a lot of these immigrants, if you measure the size of their heads, they have very small brains, which means they must not be very smart. By the way, uh, a quick aside, like many things in life, uh, the size of your brain doesn't really matter. But you know, anyway... Um, and he says, look, they clearly have bad genes. They're weaker people. They're going to be more sick, more prone to bad things. Franz Boas, the guy on the left, he also testified. He was an anthropologist. In fact, he founded anthropology, which is the study of humans. He was German-American. He taught at Yale and Harvard. He was also Jewish-American. So he was a new immigrant, but he was very well-respected. So he testified. Number one, he said, what about me? If these are all people, all bad genes, how do you explain me? Why are you guys talking to me? Which is a pretty powerful testimony. But he says, I've done the same thing Davenport has done. Not only did he also took pictures of people, measured their heads and all of that, but he did something Davenport didn't do. He went back to those same people a year later, in some cases five, ten years later, and did the same thing. You know what he found? That they were healthier, they often were bigger, even their brains were bigger. Why? Because they were eating better, they were eating healthier, they were living in healthier conditions. And your body really does change throughout your life. It doesn't, I mean, you're not going to grow a foot in your life once you're, once you're an adult, but how big you are, how tiny you are, it, it does make a difference. And so he, what, he, what he's arguing is something that we know today to be true, is that genes are really important. However, Context matters as well. How you know where you're living, how you're eating. It, it's a combination of the two. It's not you know. In other words, it's not just genes. And um, it's very compelling testimony. And today, Davenport, excuse me, Boaz would win the argument. Um, but at the time, Davenport would ultimately win the argument. And some of that has to do with the biases of the time as well. We'll come back to this testimony later. This this is it's 1911, but this is going to matter when we get to 19. So what we're starting to see, again, is uh, a fear of, of foreigners. Uh, this is the rise of nationalism, uh, what we might call cultural racism. Um, you know, racism is the belief of you know, linking physical features with other qualities. This is kind of doing the same thing, but instead of doing physical features, you're linking where somebody is from with some kind of quality. Like saying, I'm Italian, therefore I must be in the mafia. I'm German, therefore I must really like war. Uh, I'm Mexican, I'm lazy. I mean, I'm, I'm just using all these crazy stereotypes that you always hear. I'm Chinese, I can't drive, whatever. Um, I mean, it's cultural racism is what that is. You know, It doesn't really matter where you come out of your mother. I mean, culture matters, but it's not about who you are. Um, but again, nationalism is something we see throughout the 20th century where one country argues that their people are morally, intellectually, physically superior to another nation's people. Uh, this is what's going to drive people like Adolf Hitler in World War II, drive the Japanese in World War II. And it, it can be very dangerous. It is not, I want to be very careful, because there may be a question on the exam about this, it is not the same thing as patriotism. Patriotism means you love your country. Nationalism means uh, you think your country is not just better than everybody else's, but should be over everybody else. I mean, it takes it to another level, uh, that it's okay for your country 
to even maybe even take over other countries. It's actually a very ugly thing. It, 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 and uh, nationalism is, is a real problem in the 20th century, especially during World War II. Um, by the way, you might go, what's up with that really weird image there? That's uh, a, a character called Nosferatu. It's from a 1922 German film that was a big hit here in the United States. Uh, it's the story of Dracula. Uh, Dracula, of course, a vampire. Uh, a, a novel from London written by Bram Stoker uh, that was a big hit in London, which, by the way, London was also having new immigrants. Uh, big hit in London, but also a big hit here in the U.S. If you think about the story of Dracula, it's a story of somebody from Transylvania, Eastern Europe, who comes to London, might as well be New York, and begins to suck the life out of everybody. I mean, that's as, about as Freudian as you get. It is a novel, a movie, if you will, about a fear of foreigners. And think about how you defeat, in those old movies, how do you defeat Dracula? You use a cross, usually a crucifix, um, which is a Catholic symbol. Uh, but it's also kind of an anti-Jewish symbol. Uh, you use garlic. Again, garlic was seen as an immigrant food. So what, what Dracula would have done while he was really alive now repels him while he's dead. Um, it, in other words, Dracula kind of is all the fears of immigrants wrapped up in the one person. He's kind of Catholic. He's kind of Jewish. He's Eastern European. And Nasrati, for instance, is literally a Jewish stereotype in the way he looks and such. Um, again, I'm always interested in what scares people at different times in history. And Dracula scared people at this time because we were afraid of immigrants at this point. So here is another, this is from, again, the early 20th century, here is another example of Uncle Sam's Thanksgiving dinner. This is a direct response to the one I showed you earlier in this lecture. And again, notice Number one, you got somebody who's at the head of the table, white Uncle Sam. Look who's serving the food, an African-American. And now it's a very rowdy affair uh, with all these stereotypes. And um, you got hordes of people coming in the front door. This is not a very nice image. This is, this is a very negative image of immigrants. And uh, as you can see, tastes are starting to change in America. So in addition to nationalism, we also see something called nativism. I have a picture of the Statue of Liberty here, because even though that is a symbol of, you know, welcoming foreigners, it is also kind of an ambivalence signal, a symbol, because at the same time that that is erected back in the 1880s, uh, it's also when Americans were starting to question whether we wanted immigrants here or not. Sometimes a term was used back then called 100% Americanism. This is the idea that um, if you in any way act Italian, or Japanese, or Jewish, or Russian, in any way, the way you dress, the way you eat, then you're not really an American. You're, you know, you're, you're still a foreigner. You have to be 100% American. Of course, which begs the question, what does it mean to be an American? What does that actually mean? Uh, and of course, that's different for everybody. Uh, I always use the example of my wife and I. Uh, I my family come from Florida and Arkansas, very Southern. Uh, they're Irish, Scottish, Irish in their heritage. My wife's family comes from New Jersey and Pennsylvania and Ohio. Uh, they're German American. Uh, we're all fully American, 100% Americans. And yet, when our families get together for Christmas dinner, Thanksgiving dinner, uh, the food is very different. Uh, they have traditions that we don't do. We have traditions they don't do. And yet, our ancestors go back 200 years. And yet, things that my family do, I can trace back to Scotland and Ireland and England. Things that her family do, they can trace back to England, but also Germany. And so, you know, are, are we not 100% American? Of course not. Of course, I mean, of course we're all Americans. Uh, but you never let go of some of that culture. And it's part of your heritage. Uh, but there was a belief that if you're too foreign, that you're not really American. It's very... Uh, again, it's very unrealistic, but it's often used, even nowadays, sometimes used as a tool against people who are immigrants. Oh, look at that. I heard you use that Spanish word. You're not really American. Um, but nativism, referring to you want people who are native to here, as opposed to the foreigners. Um, it, we, we see nativism emerge because of fears of diseases, radical politics, religious fears, and loss of jobs. Diseases is a legit fear. Uh, it's, I mean, it's probably what's going to bring humans down nowadays is disease. 
Um, and, you know, and, and we can see history uh, examples of this. As I said, um, you know, at one time there were some illegal immigrants, undocumented immigrants uh, that came over from Europe and they came over uninvited and wiped out uh, millions of the native population. Of course, they were people from England and Spain, and they founded colonies like St. Augustine and Jamestown and Plymouth, uh, and they wiped out the native peoples, the Native Americans. Uh, and the, those were, again, illegal docu uh, illegal immigrants, if you will. Uh, and I'm not being just being sarcastic. I mean, this is, this is why there aren't many Native Americans anymore. So that is a legit fear. Um, it did get it with new immigration it turned out not to be a major problem, but the fear was there. Radical politics, that is a reference to socialism and communism. There was a real fear, two brand new political ideas. Uh, there was a fear the immigrants would come over and start revolutions. And there were actually a couple that tried to do that. But relatively speaking, that ended up not being the case. Religious fears. Today, for some people, it might be Muslims. At this point, it was Jews and Catholics uh, were the real fears. And loss of jobs, something else that people still fear today. Uh, even though the reality is immigrants tend to do the jobs that nobody else does. Um, but back then it turned out that there were plenty of jobs to go around, so nobody lost their jobs to immigrants at this point. But the fears were legitimate and, uh, and were real for the people at the time. And so this is one of the reasons why we see nativism. Let's use it, I'll try to do this quickly, but let's use an example, one group. I'm going to use Chinese Americans as our group. Because they were kind of, the, even though they, they, they came over before 1880, they were sort of our first new immigrant group, and they set the pattern for this. So before 1849, we hardly saw any Chinese Americans in this country, hardly any Asians at all. Uh, if you saw any Asians, you probably saw them in a circus, and something very ugly, something called a freak show. The first a uh, Asian woman in America that we know of is a woman named A. Fong Moy, who literally you would pay a quarter to see her walk around and talk in Chinese and eat food and write her name in Chinese language. But the most famous of these was Chang and Ng Bunker, who were uh, the original Siamese twins. By the way, that is considered, uh, a Siam was sometimes a word used for China. Um, and that is considered a derogatory term today. What you're supposed to say is conjoined twins. Uh, but they were the, literally the first Siamese twins. And they were joined uh, kind of at the chest, uh, not quite at the shoulder. Um, and today they could be separated, but back then they weren't able to be. And so not only were they Chinese, but they were also conjoined twins. They made lots of money for P.T. Barnum. Uh, eventually they retired and settled down in South Carolina, where they both married two different women, and they had 11 children between them. And at least one of those children grew up to fight for the Confederacy uh, during the Civil War. Uh, you don't tend to think of Chinese Americans fighting in the Civil War, but there was at least one. Um, but they're kind of a symbol of how exotic Asians were seen by Americans. Because again, this was a period where nobody would have seen anybody that looks different than them. But after 1849, we start to see lots and lots of Asians coming over, primarily Chinese. Because 1848, gold was discovered in California. So in 1849, we get the 49ers, people from Eastern uh, United States, but also from China. Um, Mark Twain, the writer, uh, who was one of these early 49ers when he was a teenager, wrote about Chinese. He said, they are quiet, free from drunkenness, and peaceable. A disorderly Chinaman is rare, and a lazy one does not exist. So uh, initially, Chinese immigrants were seen in a very positive way, because there was only a very small group of them initially. By the way, the Chinese reaction to the U.S. is very interesting. Uh, they thought we were extremely dirty. We were always shaking hands and eating food with our metal utensils, uh, wearing our tight pants. And they thought, well, how weird. Why don't you just bow to each other? So you don't have to shake hands. Why don't you cut your food up into small pieces and eat it with nice, soft, wooden chopsticks? Um, why don't you wash your hands more? Why don't you wear nice, relaxing clothing like we wear, so these tight clothes that you guys wear? So it's interesting. I'm talking a lot about how Americans react to immigrants. But sometimes we forget immigrants react to us as well. They got their own opinions. Uh, after the gold rush ended, most of these guys, and again, it was almost all men, and most of these men thought they were going to go back home fairly quickly, uh, started working on the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, which was completed in 1869. After that, farming, and again, they're almost primarily in California, uh, farming becomes the main industry. 
1886, 90% of farmers in California were Chinese. They revolutionized farming in China, excuse me, in California. A China, by the way, California was the wheat capital of the nation at this point. And they're also the ones that introduced citrus to California, because citrus originally goes back to China. Um, and this is where the problems start. Um, it, it is ironic. Uh, people often blame immigrants for all kinds of problems. You know, they say, oh, they're failures and they're criminals and all that. But here's what usually happens. Immigrants start to come over. There's just a few people. Everybody kind of digs it. Hey, that's cool. But once they start coming over in larger numbers, people start getting very scared. And especially once they start being successful. So the very thing that people accuse them of not being uh, <laughs> when they actually are successful, which is what you want them to be, then everybody gets really scared. So once California, once the Chinese start doing very good at farming in California, California start to get very scared of Chinese. It's like you can't win either way. And also they do something very normal. They begin to live together. Um, you know, if we were all to move to China tomorrow, even if we don't all know each other very well, we would probably all live in a similar community together because we all speak the same language, we eat similar foods, we celebrate similar holidays. So if we were all in Beijing, we'd probably be living in Yankee Town together. Uh, so it's not surprising that people who, who act alike, come from a similar culture, often live in similar neighborhoods. Uh, it makes total sense, but that also provokes fears. Uh, even today, when, when people or driving, and they wind up in a neighborhood where everybody looks different than them, that's when everybody starts locking the doors and getting very nervous. Because again, people are often afraid of people who are different than them. And so it wasn't surprising that you start seeing Chinatowns in places like New York or LA or San Francisco. Um, uh, the assumption was this is where all the crime happened. This is a horrible place, which for the most part is myth. And we also start seeing, you know, as other immigrants come over, we see Japan towns in places like San Diego and Los Angeles. Or Little Italy's in places like Boston or New York City. Or even uh, Little Cuba's in South Florida. Uh, again, it starts to provoke a lot of fear. So what we start to see by the 1870s and 1880s is a rise of really a fear and even hatred of the Chinese. A fear that they're going to create monopolies. And take over. Now, again, the United States was, by this point, probably about 50 million people and climbing very quickly. There were less than 200,000 Chinese in this entire country, less than 1%. And most of them lived in California. But yet, throughout the country, there was a fear that the Chinese were going to take over. And so there's lots of political cartoons like this one. Again, portraying the Chinese in almost this alien, uh, monstrous way. So there was a big, a big push that the federal government should step in and exclude the Chinese from coming over. This was, you know, again, we had no laws against immigration at this point. And these are a couple of typical cartoons showing this fear. Finally, in 1882, Congress did pass an act, the Chinese Exclusion Act. And there was lots of celebration in California over this. Um, and many Chinese immigrants were murdered or beaten up or run out of town when this law was passed. It, it really unleashed a very ugly um, impulse in a lot of people. Now, the Chinese uh, Exclusion Act was only for 10 years. 1892, they decided to extend it for 10 more years. In 1902, they said, hell, that's working pretty good. Let's just extend it forever. And it would stay in place, actually, until 1943. It's only because of World War II, because we were fighting the Japanese and we were allied with the Chinese that we finally repealed the law. But of course, by then, the fear of Chinese had already gone away. There were a few exceptions. If you're an educator, you could come over. Or if you're the family of a merchant, you were allowed to come over. But basically, 1882, for the very first time, we see an entire group of people prevented from coming to the U.S. That was the first group that ever happened to. Uh, 1924, pretty much everybody is going to be excluded. So this, some of what I've been talking about, nationalism, nativism, Chinese Exclusion Act, it feels very different from how we typically describe ourselves as a, a nation of immigrants, a melting pot of different people. So what of the melting pot? Well, let's deal with that a little bit. Now, I love this image here. This is Henry Ford had all these, you know, Ford factories, and he liked immigrants, some immigrants, as we'll see. 
And he used to have these English schools, as he called them, um, where immigrants, say, from Germany would come over and, 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 and before they started working for two or three weeks. But I, by the way, I don't think this is a bad idea. Uh, they would be taught English and they would be taught how to manage money and how to, you know, I mean, I, you know, I go to Scotland every year with students. And I tell you, the first time I went to Scotland, I could have used a course like this to learn the culture a little bit. And then when they graduate this English school, they do the ceremony. And this is what you see here. And again, there's this big giant pot. And by the way, a melting pot is, 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 in the old days used to be what you melted metal into to turn it into other metals. Nowadays, of course, I think of food. I think of fondue. But anyway, you see this big giant pot. And as part of the ceremony, the workers would step up into this big pot wearing their immigrant clothing. And then they get down into this big giant pot. They take off this clothing. And underneath they had their quote unquote American clothes. And they come out with their American flags. And they're now part of us. And again, it's kind of a sweet ceremony. And, you know, and it's kind of this kind of pro immigrant, we're all in this together kind of image. Um, but as you'll see, it's a little bit ambivalent again. So here's Henry Ford, uh, again, the guy famous for the cars and the assembly line. He was somebody that everybody listened to at the time. He was kind of like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or, I hate to say it, Donald Trump of his day. Anyway, here's Henry Ford in 1920. What of the melting pot? The problem is not with the pot so much as it is the base metal. Some metals cannot be assimilated, refuse to mix with the molten mass of citizenship. They remain ugly, indissoluble lumps. How did this base metal get in? So again, Henry Ford is saying, some immigrants are great, some are terrible. I mean, this is almost eugenicist here. You know, there are some bad genes out there. We need to keep those bad genes out. And for Henry Ford, there was one group in particular he did not like. Now, immigrants, one thing that I didn't talk about this when I talk about the Chinese, one thing that we see with immigrants, and this is still the case today, is that usually when groups first come over, there's often an industry or a job that they start to do. For instance, with Chinese immigrants, it was laundry mats. Americans don't like to wash their laundries back in the 1800s. So Chinese immigrants often did laundry mats. And even today, if you go to a lot of places in D.C. or Boston or New York, you go to dry cleaners or Laundromats are often run by Chinese American families. It's still a niche, if you will. Um, nowadays, like say Mexican American families often open up restaurants. And sometimes that's their initial jobs. Excuse me. Well, movies were one of those uh, areas that uh, were known for this. This was uh, a, a place for immigrants to come in. Uh, I, and I know you've seen this before when we talk about movies a little bit, but I'm repeating this slide. The movie students, a niche for immigrants. Um, again, 19-teens, 1920s, films were both popular, uh, but they weren't seen as respectable work, as we've talked about. Progressives didn't like them. Uh, but, in, but everybody wanted to see movies, just nobody wanted to be caught making movies. So immigrants often fill that niche. And again, the word niche means a space, your little place in the world. Um, Italian Americans, Irish Americans, German Americans, and especially Jewish Americans. To give you an example, the head of every major studio was Jewish American, mostly from Germany, Russia, or Eastern Europe, because it was one of the few trades open up to them. Um, by the way, this unfortunately has led to this idea of Jews controlling Hollywood, Jews controlling the entertainment industry, uh, which is a myth, actually. Uh, but this, is, this stems from this, you know, because if you go to Hollywood today, there's people from all over the world running Hollywood, uh, not just Jewish Americans. But again, this is very typical of what happened with immigrants. But sometimes, again, sort of like when immigrants are successful, sometimes once they fill that niche, that's when everybody gets very afraid. And, you know, so. and again, I've already, I think, played you a scene from this uh, already. But uh, the jazz singer, uh, it's interesting because it's uh, not only the first sound the film, but it's one of the only Hollywood films to deal with immigrants. One of the things that immigrants did when they made movies is they made movies about people who weren't immigrants. In fact, most Hollywood stars and directors changed their names so they didn't sound foreign. Um, they, in fact, most of the Hollywood studios didn't want people to know that they were Jewish. You know, they, they would out of the way so people didn't know they were Jewish or immigrants or anything. So this is a unique movie because it actually deals with the issue of being an immigrant, and it deals specifically with being Jewish American. And I'll talk about this in another lecture. It also deals with the issues of race, because as you can see, there's Al Jolson, 
a Jewish American singer uh, in blackface. And so we'll talk about that another day. I just want you to know I'm not ignoring the fact that the guy's in blackface there. So Henry Ford, uh, the group he was not a fan of were Jewish immigrants. He was very, very fearful of Jewish. He was extremely anti-Semitic, which means anti-Jewish. And so because we're in Southwest Georgia, and most students are not Jewish, I've had a few over the years, but um, I find that there, even though there is a synagogue right here in Bainbridge, I find that most people in this area are a little bit lacking in their knowledge of what it means to be Jewish. So I thought it'd be interesting to just briefly talk about this, because it does come up later in this course, when we get into World War II. Uh, and of course, this semester, fall of 2015, we have a Holocaust survivor coming to the college. And I think, again, having some background on this would not be a bad idea. Uh, so what does it mean to be Jewish? Who's a Jew, in other words? It could be several things. It can be religious. It's, you know, if you practice the Judaic faith, um, which, you know, basically the Old Testament, um, your Jewish Jesus, for instance, was a Jew. Um, but it can also be secular, meaning non-religious. So in other words, uh, it's also a culture. And, you know, it's a, sometimes a different way of dressing, a certain way of food, especially at one time. Uh, for instance, you could, be a Jew, you could be Jewish but convert to Christianity. But you still might consider yourself to be Jewish. You say, you know, I'm a Christian Jew or I'm a Muslim Jew. But you don't usually see, or I'm an atheist Jew. But you don't usually see people say, hi, I'm a Christian. I'm an atheist. But I'm also a Christian. <laughs> you know, you don't usually say both or one or the other. Uh, so that's what I mean. Being Jewish can also be a heritage. It can be very much your culture, in addition to being your religion. Um, it can also be a nationalism. Um, in the late 1800s, there was the Zionist movement. This is the idea that Jews need to reclaim their homeland, which they finally do in 1948 with Israel. Um, so it can kind of be a member of a nation as well. Um, it could be all of the above. What it isn't, though, is a race. That is a myth. It is not a race, although you still people, hear people argue that. Uh, and there is no common language, although some people would argue with me. They say, wait a minute, what about Hebrew? Well, Hebrew was a dead language until the 20th century, when Israel came about. Now they've kind of revived Hebrew. Some people might talk about Yiddish, uh, which is actually a part of the German language. It's actually a dialect uh, that many Jewish people spoke, but it's not a unique language. Uh, to be Jewish does not mean to speak one particular language. So, again, very different from some of the other groups that we've talked about. Um, again, we we never saw many Jewish Americans in this country uh, before the 1880s. I mean, we I mean you know there were Jewish Americans even during the time of the American Revolution. In fact, uh, one of the first things that President George Washington did as president was go to a Jewish synagogue in New York City and remind them that they are more than welcome here in this tolerant, freedom of religion country. But generally speaking. Uh, there weren't lots of Jews here. Uh, Judah P. Benjamin, Secretary of War for the Confederacy, was Jewish. Uh, the first senator from Florida, David Levi Yuli, was Jewish. Um, but again, we're talking very, very low numbers. Uh, after uh, the time, 1880, we start seeing large numbers of Jewish peoples coming over, especially from Eastern Europe. Uh, and they're a little bit different from other new immigrants. Uh, to be Jewish means to read. You have to read for yourself. Um, so, in Jewish culture, education is highly important. So most Jews uh, were very literate, and they also were very skilled. Uh, but in most of Europe, um, Jews were not allowed to own land. So most of them were not farmers. Uh, most of them uh, did things like banking and accounting and, and uh, playwriting and, and, and teaching, jobs like that. They were very urban-based. So most immigrants moved to the countryside and became farmers, but Jews tended to move to places like New York City, which is still kind of the center of American Jewish life, and they tended to uh, come over here because of religious differences, uh, not for economic problems. They were literally running away because they were being kicked out of their country. So anti-Semitism, which means anti-Jewish. Semite is a word for Jews, and it goes back to Noah. After uh, the, the great flood, when God flooded the earth, Noah and his family were the only survivors. And Noah, of course, had three sons, uh, uh, Ham, Japheth, and Shem. Um, and Shem are where Jews are supposed to descend from. Uh, we get the word Semite from Noah's son, Shem. So if you're anti-Semitic, it means that you're anti-Jewish. So why do we see anti-Semitism? 
even today. Where, where, does, where does this come from? Um, some of this is religious, especially back in the day in Europe. Um, you know, Europe was all Christian at one point. So the idea is, you know, you're supposed to, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to replace Jewish theology with Christian theology. And if you don't, then you're a bad person. There's also the idea that Jews killed Jesus. And it is true in the Bible that you do see some of the Jewish leaders saying that we accuse Jesus of blasphemy. But of course, it was the Romans that actually killed Jesus. Jesus was Jewish himself. Um, but uh, this is kind of an ongoing idea that you still hear people say, oh, those terrible Jews are Christ killers. Um, of course, ironically, Jesus, according to the prophecy, has to die so he can be resurrected. So actually, if the Jews did indeed kill Jesus, they were actually doing a good thing? But weren't they supposed to do that? But nobody thinks of it that way. Uh, anyway, um, and the other one is that the Jews are supposed to be the chosen people. So a lot of people were anti-Semitic for these reasons, for religious reasons. And, you know, and, um, oh, anyway, I'm going to skip this today. No, I'm going to skip this today. Pay no attention to this. I should have taken all this out. We'll talk about it another day. Okay, sorry, I should have taken all that out. I meant to take it out. Uh, that's a whole other topic. I was going to talk about passion plays, but I won't today. There's also secular reasons, non-religious reasons. Some of this has to do with superstitions, and some of this has to do with segregation. Because Jews uh, often were segregated out of, of the cities, they had to live in certain neighborhoods. For instance, the word ghetto is an Italian word for Jewish neighborhood. That's actually what ghetto means. It doesn't mean poor neighborhood, it means Jewish neighborhood. Um, so when people are segregated out, and people don't, like, like Japan towns or Chinatowns, that's when all the fears kick in. And people don't, you know, we fear what we don't know, you know, and, if, and because, because Jews were segregated out, they were seen as very different and strange. And of course, Jews had their own faith. They celebrated on a different day. They had their own ceremonies. They read their own religious books. So if you didn't understand Jewish culture, you started filling in what you didn't know with all types of superstitions and such. Vampire legends actually originate with fears of Jewish people, for instance. Um, and, you know, in Europe at one time, uh, they used to mark people who were Muslim and people who were Jewish with symbols. If you were a Muslim, a half moon you'd have to wear in your clothing so everybody knew you were Muslim. If you were Jewish, you had to wear a star. And so Muslims and Jews were also seen as sorcerers and magicians and stuff. And even today, if you go to Disney World and you look at, you know, you know magician clothing, notice what's on them. Half moons and stars. Stars. This goes back to the fear of Muslims and Jews in Europe hundreds of years ago. Here's another image from Disney's Fantasia. <laughs> but one of the, the old superstitions is called the blood libel. This is the belief that Jews would kidnap Christian babies and drink their blood. Uh, these are uh, two images from old books from the 1500s. On the left, it's very blurry, but you see all these Jewish peoples with a Christian baby, and they're about to rip the baby open and drink the blood. On the right, you see a couple of Jewish people with the devil, and the devil's about to have sex with this animal. This is what Jews are supposed to do during their religious ceremonies. But this idea of the blood libel goes all the way back to the 1100s in England, when a baby was found murdered. And the assumption was that the Jews did it. And the Jewish neighborhood in Norwich was actually burnt to the ground, and everybody killed in it. And that started this legend of the blood libel which you still hear people reference today in parts of the world. Um, and again, it, it evolved in this whole idea that Jews were always trying to capture Christian babies and eat them. And uh, this is during the Nazi days. This is you know, what Jews were supposed to do to Germans. They were ready to cut them and bleed them out. And even nowadays, in parts of the Middle East, a lot of Arabic peoples, Muslim peoples, would accuse Israel of a blood libel. Here's the leader of Israel with his chalice full of Arabic blood that he's about to drink. Um, and here's another example of that. Notice I showed you that picture of a vampire. This guy literally looks just like that vampire. Finally, in the early 20th century, there's also the racial, quote-unquote, science aspect of anti-Semitism. The idea that Jews have different genes. That they had lesser genes. In fact, Adolf Hitler, the leader of the Nazis, even argued that Jews weren't even human. 
that they were other, I mean, I'm not making this up, that they were creatures that looked human, uh, but weren't even fully human, which is why he argued they should be exterminated. So let's talk about this very quickly, because I, I, I still get students that say, no, no, Jews are a race. Come on, aren't they a whole race? Uh, by law, by U.S. law, Jews were always labeled as white, um, generally speaking. They're, although, uh, in the early 20th century, eugenicists and anthropologists sometimes argue that they were a different race. Uh, but nowadays, there is no validity to that. But let's test it. Let's look at some very famous Jewish celebrities of the last 30, 40 years. And let's see if we can denote any racial differences. So here are uh, two famous comedians from New York. On one side is Woody Allen, and the other side is John Stewart. So they look exactly the same, right? I, I, some of these, by the way, are pretty dated. I probably need to update these. I put some of this together 10 years ago. So here's Sarah Jessica Parker from Sex and the City and Howard Stern, the famous radio DJ. All look the same, right? Or Jack Black, Sarah Silverman. Ashley Tisdale. I have her in here because my son's a big fan of uh, Phineas and Ferb, but she does one of the voices on it. Or Katie Court. A lot of people don't realize she's Jewish. She just looks just like Howard Stern, right? Or two idols when I grew up. Fonzie from Happy Days or Harrison Ford, also known as Han Solo. Or Captain Kirk and Captain Spock from Star Trek, all Jewish. Or what is Patro, or Lisa Kutrow from Friends? Or Robert Downey Jr., also known as Sherlock Holmes, also known as Iron Man. Or, again, this is from a couple years ago, or uh, both of the stars of Oz the Great and Powerful, Mila Kunis, who's originally from Russia, or James Franco. Gene Wilder, the real Willy Wonka. The other guy who plays Spider-Man, Andrew Garfield. Maya Angela from Saturday Night Live. Drake from Canada. Whoopi Goldberg. And Rashida Jones, all Jewish. Jake Gyllenhaal. And of course, his sister Maggie. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix and Shia LaBeouf. Gene Simmons from Kiss. Sharon Osbourne. In fact, Gene Simmons from Kiss was born originally in Israel. Seth Rogen, Scarlett Johansson, Amy Winehouse. Stephen Fry, my favorite British writer. And of course, Harry Potter. A lot of people don't realize he's Jewish. Barbara Walters, Elizabeth Taylor. Of course, they all look like Howard Stern, right? Natalie Portman, Paula Abdul. Chelsea Handler, Jennifer Conley. Oh, there's Franco and Ashley Tisdale. Get everyone got duplicated. Oops. And my favorite actor, Paul Newman. And of course, got to got to include Sammy Davis Jr. Who converted to Judaism in the 1960s. So hopefully, uh, the point is, and I could I, I know I need some newer people in there. Uh, hopefully, the, the point is none of those people all looked alike. Yet they're all Jewish. And I don't think there's any semblance that they're all members of the same race. So we talked about the KKK before in this class when we talked about Reconstruction. And I talked about how it went away. Well, it comes back in 1915. And it comes back in Atlanta, Georgia, on top of Stone Mountain. Why? Why did it come back? It may not come back for the reason you think it did. It actually has to do with immigration. One of the most famous court cases in America was the Leo Frank case in 1915. Um, 1915 was probably the worst period for not only race relations, but also for immigrant relations. We were really not very tolerant around 1915 as a country. Uh, it was very common to go into the store and be able to buy a book called Jew Jokes. Or, or if I was a teacher of a class, I could tell anti-Jewish jokes, and I wouldn't even have to think about getting fired. Um, in 1915, a lot of factories were opening up throughout Georgia. Um, and there was a lot of concern about these new factories. A lot of the people working at these factories were young women. Um, and so there's a lot of concern uh, here in the South that these women are going to be mistreated. A lot of them were 14, 15, 16 years old. And a lot of these factories were run by people from up north because, again, we were just starting to build factories here. 
And so most people who ran factories were from New Jersey and New York and Chicago. So there's already some tension there to begin with. Um, and one of these factories was the National Pencil Factory in Marietta, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta. And that was supervised by a, guy, a young man named Leo Frank, who you see here. He was a young married guy, just had a young baby. Uh, his parents were from Germany. They were Jewish. He was born in the U.S. and he moved down to Atlanta, Georgia uh, to open up this factory. And he, you know, was doing fairly well, but there was some anti-Semitism in this area. And one of his workers was a young woman named Mary Fagan. She was 15 years old. Here she looks much, much younger. This has been kind of touched up a little bit uh, to make her look even younger. Uh, Mary Fagan worked at his factory. Well, one night, Friday night, Mary Fagan is leaving uh, to go out with her friends, and she realizes she hasn't gotten her paycheck yet. She's one of the last workers there. She goes to Leo Frank's office. He's still working late, and he writes her a check, and off she goes. She's never seen alive again. Uh, all weekend, everybody's looking for Mary Fagan. What happened to Mary Fagan? Um, and there's already a lot of rumors about what must have happened to her. Well, Sunday morning, two days later, a parent's worst nightmare is uh, revealed when her body, naked body, is found at the basement of the factory. She's been brutally raped, beaten, and murdered. And immediately, uh, Leo Frank is arrested for the rape and murder of Mary Fagan, despite the fact that uh, not only his wife but others have testified that he was elsewhere over the weekend. Because it's been very clear that her body had been kept in the basement for a while, alive, before she was murdered. Uh, this is not something that happened in five seconds. The person who found the body was a guy named John Conley. Now, we haven't talked about segregation yet. We're going to do that next week. But when we talk about segregation, you're going to realize that back in 1915, any crime that happened, almost immediately, it was assumed an African-American did it. This is one of the few cases where that did not happen. And it's even more interesting because John Connolly probably raped and murdered Mary Fagan. I mean, based on modern evidence today, he probably was the rapist and murderer. But anti-Semitism was so strong in 1915 in Marietta, Georgia, that that was even overlooked. Why do I say that? Because one thing, whoever finds a body often is the person who did the murder, just in case you ever find a dead body, you know you're going to be the suspect. Um, there were some human feces found beside the body. John Connolly later admitted it was his own feces, which is already very strange. Uh, and again, today there's actually some really strong evidence that you know, he did a deed raper. Um, but everybody had already made up their mind. Leo Frank did it. So Leo Frank was tried and convicted of the rape and murder of Mary Fagan and was going to be sentenced to death. This, despite the fact that many people, including Alonzo Mann, testified um, that, yes, indeed, Leo Frank, the girl came, he gave her money, she left, he was nowhere near her, he was, you know, I mean, despite all of that, doesn't matter. Once the conviction came down, it was so clearly uh, a case of, of bad justice. A lot of supporters of Leo Frank in places like Chicago, New York, began to write Georgia Governor John Slayton to say, hey, look, you know, you, you, need, you need to redo this case. Now, again, in Georgia at that time, anti-Semitism was common. I mean, this guy not only was Jewish, but he was New York. He was a Yankee. You know, and so for a politician to step in when everybody in Georgia assumed that the right guy was convicted would have been political suicide. And yet Governor Slayton did it. He commuted his execution and ordered a retrial. And by this point, there was enough evidence to exonerate Leo Frank. And again, he really didn't do it. And John Connolly probably would have been prosecuted. However, before that was allowed to happen, a group of men broke into the jail, removed Leo Frank. In fact, if you look here, this is Leo Frank. You can see he was still in his night clothes. There's a sheet wrapped around his legs. Uh, they lynched him. They hung him. Because they said, if the, go if the governor isn't going to hang you, we will hang you. And they lynched him. 
And the guys who did this called themselves the Knights of Mary Fagan. And they met on top of Stone Mountain. This is not done, by the way. This is just a random image. But they met on top of, on top of Stone Mountain. And they burnt a cross to let everybody know that this is a Christian nation. And we don't tolerate Jews here. And they decided to stop calling themselves Knights of Mary Fagan. They decided they're going to call themselves the KKK. They're going to go back to the KKK. Because they said, we got all these immigrants here. We need to control them. So this is when the KKK started burning crosses. And this is why the KKK started burning crosses. When you think of the KKK today, you think of all those crazy right robes and all those crazy words they use, flavern and all that, grand cyclops. Guess where they all get this from? Why do they want to be the KKK? Which hadn't been around for 40 years. Oh, by the way, real quick. Again, today it's just common knowledge that Leo Frank did not do it. He was completely. But they did this because a movie had come out in 1915, a movie called Birth of a Nation, a movie about the Reconstruction period. And the heroes of the movie were the KKK. And in this movie, they created these crazy costumes for the KKK. It was just made up for Hollywood. And um, the Knights of Mary Fagan were imitating that movie. So a movie inspired the real KKK to come back. So the KKK came back as an anti-immigrant Although they also went after African Americans, as we'll talk about next week. So again, you, we talk about the role of film in history. This is another example of the role of movies in history. By the way, Birth of a Nation was a massive film, three-hour movie. It premiered at the White House. Woodrow Wilson loved it. He said it was like history written with lightning. Henry Ford, again, was very anti-Semitic, and he did play a role, unfortunately, in spreading these ideas. He published a book called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. I'm going to, I'm going to restate that title. It, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion are supposed to be the minutes of the leaders of the Jewish movement that take over the world. It is supposed to be a secret document of how the Jews are going to take over the media, take over the government, take over the banks and all of this. It's totally a fraud. It was originally written in 1865 in Russia as a novel, and then it was republished in Germany in the 1880s. It's a total fraud. And even Henry Ford later will admit that he was duped into publishing this. But again, unfortunately, these ideas, this has been a theme of this class, ideas matter. And Protocols of the Elders of Zion is still published today in parts of the world. And this Henry Ford was somebody that Adolf Hitler was a big fan of, and he read this book. And it influenced a lot of Hitler's ideas. And again, even though Ford later would apologize for publishing this, the damage was already done. So again, this is one of the reasons I go into anti-Semitism, because, again, we see the repercussions of this in the 1930s and 1940s later. And here's a couple of different versions of it as they were being published. All right, I've, I've kind of gone off into the weeds a little bit. Let's bring it back to new immigration very quickly. 1924, an immigration law is passed. Um, again, going back to 1911 with Congress, with that 40-volume study they did, they did conclude that there does seem to be some problems. They did another study in 1914, concluding the same thing. But then World War I happened, and immigration slowed down a little bit. And we got involved in World War but after World War I in 1920, we passed a law to start restricting immigration. We did a couple more laws, but 1924 was the big one. Uh, basically, it pretty much ended almost all immigration to the United States. The way they did it was they set up quotas for various countries, like maybe literally 100 people from Italy were allowed to come over. Um, and again, it stopped almost all immigration. It didn't apply to the Western Hemisphere. But that same law also set up an armed border between the U.S. and Mexico. So when people talk about a wall today, uh, any kind of border between us and Mexico didn't even start until 1924. Um, this is when that began. All right, I know it's a little long. I've gone just over 90 minutes, so about the length of one class. That, that was my goal, to just take up the length of one class. So five minutes over. Sorry I went a little bit over. Uh, but luckily, I think 
for this might have been a repeat for some of you. Um, so maybe you can fast forward a little bit of this. Other than that, thank you, and uh, that's it.